I'm gripping the steering wheel, my eyes focused on the asphalt unfolding before us. The dashboard shows we're going at a steady speed, and I can feel the smooth hum of the engine. Haley, Mike, and Tyler are in the car, and their mood matches mine, eager and upbeat. Haley is in the passenger seat, scrolling through playlists on her phone to set our soundtrack for the journey. She finally settles on some classic rock tunes, and the car fills with the sound of guitars and drums. She's dressed comfortably in jeans and a t-shirt, her hiking boots already hinting at the outdoor weekend that lies ahead. Mike and Tyler are in the back. Mike is leaning against the window, gazing at the passing scenery. He has his camera with him, and every so often, he lowers the window to snap a picture of something that catches his eye a barn in the distance, or a particularly striking tree standing alone in a field. Tyler, on the other hand, is immersed in a travel guide about the region we're driving through. He's our planner, the one who mapped out our entire camping itinerary. He's making last-minute checks, ensuring that we've got all our bases covered. The car is packed with our gear. The trunk holds our tents, sleeping bags, and camping stove. A cooler with food and drinks is wedged between Mike and Tyler, and our backpacks are stuffed with essentials like first aid kits, flashlights, and maps. Everything is neatly organized, a testament to our collective excitement and preparation for the trip. The conversation is easy and light, bouncing from recent work stories to the activities we're looking forward to. Kayaking, hiking, and a night under the stars are high on everyone's list. I occasionally join in, but mostly I listen, my mind partly on the road and partly on the adventure that awaits us. Man, I can't wait to get there. This week has been brutal, Tyler says, his fingers massaging his forehead as if trying to erase the stress that's built up over the past few days. His work laptop is stashed in the back, a symbol of the job he's happy to be away from, even if just for a weekend. I hear you. Haley responds, her eyes focused on the road ahead, but her mind clearly welcoming the break. Her phone is turned off, sitting in the glove compartment, as if to emphasize her point about needing distance from everyday life. A break from civilization is what we all need. At that moment, the silhouette of a man becomes apparent on the side of the road. He's standing still, but his thumb is animated, pointed in the direction we're headed. The hitchhiker is wearing a weathered jacket and carrying a single backpack, signaling a potential familiarity with travel. What do you think, guys? Should we pick him up? I ask, slowing down a bit to gauge the group's reaction. My hand hovers over the turn signal, ready to pull over or continue based on their responses. Mike, who's been quiet, finally speaks. You know how they say, don't pick up hitchhikers? His eyes are squinted in a way that suggests he's weighing the pros and cons, his own internal debate mirroring the one happening aloud in the car. His camera, which has been busy capturing scenic shots, now rests on his lap, forgotten in the moment. But he could be harmless. Besides, it could be fun, Haley argues, her adventurous spirit shining through. She's the type who loves unplanned detours and surprising twists, and her grin suggests that she's already excited by this unexpected turn of events. Tyler, not one to sit out a discussion, adds his two cents. Well, as long as he's not a serial killer or something, I'm fine with it. He's half joking, but his eyes meet each of ours in the rearview mirror, as if to make sure we're all on the same page about the risk we're considering. A brief, nervous laugh fills the car, its awkwardness hanging in the air as I make the decision to pull over. We watch as the hitchhiker starts walking toward us, his pace quick but not rushed, his face revealing a sense of relief mixed with gratitude. He appears to be in his late thirties, and his rugged features are complemented by a beard that suggests he hasn't been near a razor in days. As he gets closer, we each steal glances at each other, our faces a mix of anticipation and uncertainty. Hey there, headed to Miller's campground by any chance? The hitchhiker asks as he approaches the passenger window. His voice is clear, and he looks eager, almost as if he's been waiting for a car to go to that exact destination. His eyes meet mine and then dart briefly to Haley, Mike, and Tyler in the car, as if assessing the company he'll keep. 
That's exactly where we're going, I confirm, feeling a slight sense of relief at his destination matching ours. I unlock the doors with a press of a button. Hop in. Grasping the door handle, he swings the rear door open and slides into the back seat next to Mike, stowing his backpack at his feet. Thanks for stopping. Really appreciate it. I'm John, by the way. He extends a hand to Mike first, and then to Tyler, who both return the gesture with a quick handshake. And if you're interested, I know a shortcut to Miller's. A shortcut? Sounds good to me, I reply, intrigued by the prospect of cutting our travel, Tyler A. John leans forward slightly, pointing to a turnoff ahead that I hadn't even noticed before. It's a smaller, less maintained road that veers away from the main highway. Taking a quick second to gauge everyone's reaction and seeing no objections, I signal and make the turn onto the road John pointed out. It's narrower than the highway and lined with thick trees on both sides. As I navigate the new path, John leans back in his seat, seemingly satisfied. Meanwhile, the GPS reroutes itself, but no one pays it much attention. Mike and Tyler seem to have moved from initial skepticism to curiosity, possibly pondering what this detour might add to our adventure. Haley catches my eye and gives a small nod, confirming that she's also on board with this impromptu change in route. John appears comfortable, occasionally offering directions like keep straight or take the next right, which I follow. As we roll along the uneven road, my focus is split between John's periodic directions and the path ahead. The road is filled with small potholes and the overgrown trees cast dappled shadows on the ground. It's a different world compared to the open highway we were on earlier. The thought crosses my mind that this place seems remote, even for a shortcut. Another realization slowly creeps in. There's an absence of movement around us, a stillness that goes beyond the natural quiet of a forest. It's oddly devoid of life. Not a single squirrel darts across the road, no birds are taking flight, and I don't even notice the usual buzz of insects. Is it just me or are we not seeing any wildlife? Mike finally articulates the thought that seems to have been hanging in the air. He's put down his camera, apparently finding nothing worth capturing in this part of the forest. You're right, Haley chimes in, her eyes scanning the surroundings as if to double-check Mike's observation. It's like the forest is empty. The music that was playing earlier is now lowered, as if to give space for our conversation and concerns. Tyler tries to lighten the mood. Maybe they're all hiding because they know the weekend warriors have arrived. He gestures playfully at our camping gear in the back, trying to infuse some humor into the situation. A subdued chuckle circulates through the car, but it's a far cry from the hearty laughs we shared earlier. The laughter seems to dissipate almost as soon as it's voiced, as if absorbed by the thick trees around us. My eyes flick to the rearview mirror, catching John's expression. He appears entirely unfazed by our chatter about the lack of animals. While the rest of us are engrossed in this puzzling detail, he seems detached almost as if he's lost in his own thoughts or simply doesn't find our observation noteworthy. So, John, what brings you out here? I inquire, eager to steer the conversation away from the unsettling silence and towards something more standard. My hands grip the steering wheel a bit more firmly than before, as if trying to maintain some semblance of control over the unfolding situation. Oh, just visiting some old places, reliving memories, John replies from the back seat. His voice is steady, but the vagueness of his answer hangs in the air, evading specifics. It's as though he's sharing just enough to not be completely silent, but holding back enough to keep a veil of mystery around him. We can relate to that, right guys? Haley interjects, aiming to build some common ground between us and our enigmatic passenger. She turns her head slightly, glancing first at Mike and then at Tyler, as if searching for agreement. Yeah, totally. Mike and Tyler respond almost in unison, but their affirmations come with a quick nod rather than genuine enthusiasm. The response is automatic, almost rehearsed, like a script we all follow when trying to keep a conversation light 
and avoid confrontation. And yet, the atmosphere in the car is anything but light. Something doesn't feel quite right. The words we speak and the miles we cover do little to dispel the underlying tension. It's as if we're all collectively holding our breath, waiting for something to happen, but no one wants to be the first to voice it. We've been on John's recommended shortcut for a noticeable length of Tyler. The GPS screen in front of me is a swirl of rerouting messages and unclear pathways, offering little confidence that we're heading in the right direction. As I glance outside, the diminishing sunlight paints everything in a softer glow, while casting lengthening shadows that seep into the forest, making the trees appear more like tall, dark sentinels than ordinary woodland. Mike decides it's Tyler to break the silence that has filled the car, a silence punctuated only by the low hum of the engine and the sporadic crunch of gravel under the tires. So John, he begins, leaning slightly forward in his seat to catch John's eye in the rearview mirror. What exactly do you do for a living? John's answer is swift but unsatisfying, as he avoids making eye contact and opts instead to stare out the window at the rapidly darkening scenery. Oh, various things, he mutters, freelancing mostly. Tyler, seated beside Mike, picks up on this evasion and decides to dig a little deeper. He leans in so he's in my line of sight in the rearview mirror, making it clear that he's not just asking for his own benefit. Freelancing? That's cool. In what field? John's response is equally vague, doing nothing to allay the sense of discomfort that's growing inside me. A bit of this, a bit of that, he says folding his arms across his chest as if to physically hold back any further information. Never tied down to one thing. This ambiguous reply flips a switch in me. A sense of apprehension builds up, as if warning me that something is off. I risk a quick glance to my right, where Haley is sitting. I find her already staring back at me. Her eyes, narrowed and thoughtful, reflect what I presume is a shared sense of unease, it's a look that silently says, we both recognize that something in this situation is not right. John, why were you so interested in how isolated Miller's campground is? I bluntly ask. My eyes meet John's in the rearview mirror, looking for any sign of his true intentions. John doesn't look away. Instead, he meets my gaze. Isolation can be a good thing. Good for soul searching, don't you think? Haley picks up on the question immediately, clearly aware that the atmosphere in the car has changed. Sure, she says, but you've got to understand how it looks from our end, right? You jump into our car, claim to know a shortcut none of us have ever heard of, and then you're really interested in how isolated our destination is. Meanwhile, you're dodging questions about yourself. John's eyes narrow slightly, a subtle change in his otherwise calm demeanor. It's the first real reaction we've gotten from him. I didn't think I was being interrogated. I thought this was a friendly ride. Mike, sensing the tension but wanting to diffuse it, leans in. It is a friendly ride, he says. But friendships are based on trust, and right now, you're about as clear as mud. Tyler, who's been mostly quiet, decides this is the Tyler to speak. Look, it's not our goal to make you uncomfortable, but you've got to see this situation from our point of view as well, he says, looking earnestly at John. The tension inside the car is almost tangible, like a heavy cloud we've all been contributing to. We should turn back, Haley finally says, articulating the uneasy thought that seems to be on all of our minds. Yeah, I say, grateful that the suggestion is now out in the open. Let's get back to the main road. John, sitting in the back seat, speaks up, though his voice lacks its earlier enthusiasm. You're going to miss out on cutting half an hour off your trip, he warns. Maybe so, I respond, gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. But we're not in such a rush that we can't be cautious. Executing a U-turn on the narrow, winding road demands my full attention. I ease the car around, acutely aware of the boundaries of the road and the encroaching forest. 
Once we're pointed in the opposite direction, I feel the atmosphere in the car lighten just a little, as though we've collectively exhaled a breath we didn't know we were holding. John remains in the back seat, noticeably quiet now, his gaze fixed on the world outside the window. It's hard to ignore the shift in the car's energy since picking him up. His presence, initially a minor addition to our adventure, now feels cumbersome, as though we've added an extra load that we hadn't accounted for. The car's tires roll steadily over the smooth surface of the main road, yet the atmosphere inside is tense. The dashboard clock ticks away, marking the seconds that stretch into minutes of uncomfortable silence. I grip the steering wheel a bit tighter, keenly aware that we're all wrestling with the same dilemma, how to handle the situation with John. Haley, sitting in the passenger seat next to me, is the first to voice what we're all grappling with. Okay, we need to figure this out, she declares, her eyes meeting mine for a moment before scanning the rearview mirror. Driving around aimlessly with John in the back isn't an option, not when it feels this unsettling. Tyler, who's in the back seat next to Mike, jumps into the conversation. I agree, he says, leaning forward so he's easier to hear. Something's off. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm not comfortable with him in the car any longer. Mike, who has been quietly looking out the window, finally turns his attention back to us. Let's drop him off at the next gas station, he suggests, tapping his phone to check for nearby options. That seems like a fair compromise. It's a public place, and he can figure out his next steps from there. The immediate nods and sighs of agreement from everyone indicate that we're all on the same page. As for John, he's been silently observing our discussion from the back seat. The decision is made, now we just have to execute it. The moment of agreement is followed by a renewed sense of focus. I scan the horizon for the distinct profile of a gas station, eyes darting from road signs to the approaching buildings. My attention zeroes in on the outline of fuel pumps and a convenience store. With a sense of relief, I steer the car into the station's parking lot. But the relief is short-lived. As we pull in, it becomes evident that this place is not what we had in mind. The gas pumps stand empty, no other cars are filling up. The convenience store adjacent to it is equally desolate, its lights off and doors locked. Looks abandoned, Haley says, her voice lower than before, tinged with a palpable tension that mirrors my own feelings. Tyler, usually the jokester of the group, is not laughing now. Yeah, this isn't helping the whole creepy vibe, he admits, turning to glance at John, who's still in the back seat. John leans forward slightly, making eye contact through the rearview mirror. Look, why don't you guys just keep driving? The next station isn't too far from here, he offers, almost as if he's doing us a favor. I've had enough. The station may be abandoned, but it's still a better option than continuing this uncomfortable journey with John. No, I reply, locking eyes with him through the rearview mirror. I think you should get out here. The atmosphere inside the car is thick with tension, but there's a sense of collective resolve. We are not willing to go any further with John. Now, it's up to him to decide how he'll respond. John maintains his gaze, fixated on me through the rearview mirror. You'll regret not taking that shortcut, he states. His voice harbors a nuance that puzzles me. It might be a trace of regret or perhaps a veiled threat. The ambiguity of his tone leaves us all uneasy. We'll take our chances, Mike says his voice firm as if trying to neutralize the tension that John's words have injected into the car's atmosphere. Haley chimes in, her tone equally assertive. Yeah, I think we've had enough adventures for one day. John doesn't move at first, seemingly weighing his options, but after what feels like a long pause, he unlatches the door handle and steps out. As his feet hit the pavement and the door closes behind him, a distinct change washes over the car. It's as if an invisible weight, one we didn't fully acknowledge was burdening us, lifts instantly. 
I shift the car back into drive and exit the gas station, rejoining the flow of traffic on the main road. Even as we increase the distance between us and John, my thoughts keep circling back to the encounter. I feel like we avoided some kind of danger, though its exact nature remains unclear. No one speaks. The silence isn't just a lack of conversation, but an unspoken agreement to process what just happened. After about an hour of driving in silence, we finally arrive at Miller's campground. The car's tires crunch over the gravel and dirt as we make our way deeper into the campground. Normally, this place is a haven, a nature-filled escape from the stress of daily life. Today, it feels different. The sense of unease from our experience with John hangs in the car like a bad smell, making everything seem off. Eventually, we reach our reserved camping spot, and I put the car in park. For a moment, we all just sit there, taking in the stillness that's disrupted only by the distant sound of water lapping at the lake's edge. This place, usually a source of peace and adventure, now carries an air of uncertainty that's hard to shake. The lake that's often the focal point of our trips here doesn't look inviting anymore. Instead, its stillness seems almost eerie, matching our own apprehensions. As we step out of the car, I notice how no one is eager to unpack. We all exchange glances, our faces reflecting the mutual understanding that this isn't the trip we had envisioned. The camping gear, usually unpacked with enthusiasm, remains in the trunk and back seat. No one mentions it, but I sense that the idea of spending a night here has become as appealing as swimming in ice-cold water. Our phones don't have much service here, but even if they did, I doubt any of us would be scrolling through social media or snapping photos. The lake, the trees, the camping spot, everything is tainted by what now feels like a narrow escape. Despite the attempts to lift our spirits, the energy around setting up camp is lacking. The act of hammering in tent stakes and unrolling sleeping bags now feels like a mundane list of tasks we're ticking off. Even the fire seems off tonight. It takes several tries to get it going, and when it finally catches, the flames sputter and dance as if they too are unsure about the evening. Dinner is just as lackluster. Usually the food on camping trips tastes better than it has any right to, perhaps because it's seasoned with the fresh air and the sense of freedom that comes from being outdoors. Not this, Tylery. We eat, but there's no enjoyment in it. The steaks are chewy, the potatoes are undercooked, and the silence that accompanies the meal is thick, as if it's another dish served that nobody wants to partake in. As the sky grows darker, we gather around the fire, each lost in our own thoughts. Normally, this would be the tealer for shared stories, laughter, for making plans for hikes or fishing trips. Tonight, none of that is happening. We sit in a heavy silence, punctuated only by the occasional crackle from the fire or the distant hoot of an owl. It's as if we're all holding our breath, waiting for something we can't identify. The unease we're feeling isn't just about the strange incident with John. It's compounded by the fact that we're in the wilderness, far from the security and predictability of our daily lives. Every rustle in the bushes, every snap of a twig, feels like a potential threat. As we sit there, the weight of all these feelings bears down on us, making it clear that none of us are going to find the peace or relaxation we had originally sought from this trip. Guys, I don't think I can do this. I finally break the silence, staring into the fire. I can't relax. I'm stuck on what could have happened if we hadn't turned around. Haley nods, her face illuminated by the firelight. I'm with you. This was supposed to be a fun getaway, and now it just feels wrong. Let's pack up and get out of here first thing in the morning. Tyler and Mike respond almost at the same Tyler. Agreed. When morning comes, there's a sense of urgency that wasn't there the day before. The sun is barely up, but we're already awake, stuffing sleeping bags and disassembling tents. As we're placing the last of our gear into the car, Mike freezes. He's pulling something out from a nook under the back seat. It's small, dark, and intricately designed, 
a talisman of some sort. It's made of materials none of us recognize, twisted metal, dark beads, and what looks like animal hair. We didn't put this here, Mike says, holding it up so we can all see. We need to get rid of it, Haley says, her eyes widening. John must have left it. I don't even want to know why. Without another word, I take the talisman from Mike's hand and throw it into a nearby trash can. I don't know what it is or what its purpose could be, but I know we have to leave now more than ever. The car door slams shut, and as we pull away from the campsite, there's a collective feeling of relief. We're still full of questions, still uneasy about what transpired, but at least we're putting distance between us and whatever we narrowly avoided. With each mile that we cover, the unease starts to lift, but it's clear that this is one camping trip none of us are going to forget. As soon as we're back in the safety of our homes, the itch to know more about John is unbearable. We all agree to convene at Haley's apartment. Her coffee table is cluttered with our phones, a couple of laptops, and notepads. I'm going to start with a simple Google search, I announce, flipping open my laptop and settling into a chair. The room is tense, filled with the electricity of a shared, unspoken worry. The thought that we might discover something worse than we already suspect looms over us. Haley and Tyler, both sitting on the couch, have their phones out and are already swiping through screens. Tyler focuses on news archives while Haley scrolls through social media posts that are tagged in the area we visited. Mike opts to stand, leaning against the wall, and watches as I type. His eyes are glued to the laptop screen as my fingers dance over the keyboard, inputting search queries like hitchhiker, unexplained disappearances, and the specific region we drove through. His arms are crossed and his brows are furrowed. It's clear he's as invested in this as the rest of us. The room goes quiet except for the soft clicking of keys and the occasional ping from our phones as new search results populate. Each of us is engrossed in our task, sifting through the ocean of information for any clue that might shed light on who John really is. Every so often, one of us mutters a hmm or that's odd, but mostly it's a focused silence, a communal effort powered by a gut feeling that we stumbled upon something much larger and darker than a simple hitchhiking incident. Wait, look at this, Haley announces, lifting her phone so we can all see the screen. It's a local news report that shows a list of people who have gone missing under mysterious circumstances. Haley scrolls through the news article and we all lean in to read the details. The report outlines that over the past six months, four individuals have gone missing within a 20-mile radius of the area where we picked up John. The first person, a woman named Kate, was last seen at a local diner. The second, a man named Eric, went missing after telling friends he was going on a solo hiking trip. Both were in their late 20s, the same age group as us. The third case is about a college student named Lisa, who was visiting family and disappeared while out on a morning run. The last is a truck driver named Tom, who failed to complete his route and never returned home. Each of these individuals was in good health with stable lives, according to friends and family. None of them had reasons to vanish, and searches have turned up nothing. There's no evidence of foul play, robbery, or accidents in any of the cases. As Haley scrolls further, we see that local authorities are puzzled. They have conducted multiple search operations, used sniffer dogs, and even brought in specialists to consult on the case, but all efforts have been fruitless. The report mentions that local rumor has it tied to curious woodland activities, though the police officially dismiss this as superstition. Still, locals are advised to avoid secluded areas, especially after dark. The news report concludes with an appeal to the public for any information that might assist in the investigations. A police hotline number is listed, alongside photos of the missing individuals. Our eyes meet, and it's clear we're all thinking the same thing. We have to share what we know, even if it's only a tiny piece of this unsettling puzzle. 
Do you think this is just a coincidence? Tyler asks, apprehension clear in his voice. His eyes shift from Haley's screen to each of our faces, as if looking for reassurance but expecting none. Mike, standing a little straighter now, firmly shakes his head. I don't believe in coincidences not like this, he says, his voice carrying a note of finality. This is too specific, too localized. All these people went missing in the same area we picked up John. We can't ignore that connection. As the weight of the situation sinks in, we all share a look that says more than words could. We need to report this to the police, Mike adds, turning his attention back to Haley's phone as if expecting the list of missing people to grow before our eyes. This could be a lead, and even if it's not, it's better that they have all the information they can get. We were lucky. Others might not be. We gather at Haley's kitchen table, laying out a map to mark the route we took. Haley prints photos of the gas station from Google Maps. Tyler retrieves a notebook from his car and starts writing down the Tyler a line of events, starting from when we left our homes to the point where we dropped John off. I grab a sheet of paper and begin to sketch the talisman we found, trying to capture its intricate details. Armed with our compiled information, we drive to the police station, a sense of urgency mixed with fear. As we walk in, the atmosphere is sterile and professional. We're led to a small room where an officer sits behind a desk, her nameplate reading, Officer Martinez. She listens attentively as we recount our experience, taking notes on a legal pad. Yet, despite her professional demeanor, her expression betrays a hint of skepticism. Thank you for bringing this to our attention, Officer Martinez says after we finish. We'll look into it. However, I have to tell you, without solid evidence or any direct connection to the ongoing investigations, it's hard to say what steps we can take next. Weeks roll by, and the hope that the police will uncover something begins to fade. John remains a mystery, and the local news reports no progress on the unexplained disappearances. Emails and phone calls to the police station yield the same result. Ongoing investigation with no new updates. While the lack of resolution is frustrating, it reinforces the idea that our instincts were our saving grace. The unsettling feeling we had wasn't paranoia. It was a primal warning, and listening to it might have kept us safe from an otherwise dangerous fate. In the wake of the experience, subtle changes manifest in our daily lives. We become more aware of our surroundings, taking note of faces in crowds and cars following too closely. The simple act of locking our doors, once done thoughtlessly, is now performed with an awareness of the potential danger that exists in the world. Trusting strangers becomes something we think twice about, no longer a given in casual interactions. We're all a little more cautious now, a little less trusting of strangers. And while we don't talk about it much, the experience serves as a chilling reminder of what can happen when you let your guard down, even for a moment. Some Talirus, trusting your gut isn't just a saying, it's a necessity.